All right, lightning talk. And I will confess that this is going to be a little bit less HTML5 and more uh, pure JavaScript, kind of uh, focused on the folks that are maybe uh, purely fed developers or just new to JavaScript, find, uh, discover some of these little pitfalls that can uh, cause you a bunch of headaches. So with that, um, let's start off with the very basics of JavaScript. We're using Chrome right here. Right click, inspect, bring up the uh, developer tools. We're in the console. And uh, let's start off with some variables. A variable here is uh, just something that we can mess with, as you guys all know. There's a variable named text. It says hello. And then everybody knows what I'm going to do next. And uh, that is world. And you can see that we can combine variables, doing something like this. And you get uh, hello world. Variables don't have to be words. You can make uh, variables that are numbers. So let's say uh, this number is 3, as you can see. And then we're going to do another one that is uh, like a double. And that is. 5.6. You can add those together. This is pretty basic. 8.6. You can add variables together that are of different types. So let's try that. Text 2 plus num1 here. World 3. So that's kind of cool. It just thought it was a string. And it put my number into uh, the first string. Let's do it the other way around. See what happens. OK, three world. And uh, at some point, you're going to start taking uh, variables or text from, say, a web service call. And you will try to add some numbers together. And you'll get a number and a text back. And that's going to suck. You actually wanted a number. So you'll use this function called parseint. And you'll say, let's parse this uh, whatever I pass into it. and Give me the number. And then it's magical. It gives me a three. Uh, let's do that again on the first set that I did, just to show what can happen. If it doesn't have an idea, it'll give you nan, not a number. OK, kind of useful. Um, but here's one of the first pitfalls. And that is, if you um, have a number that starts with a, a zero, it thinks it's octal. So in that case, my 0 padded 10 gave me an 8, which at some day, you are going to get uh, a web service call back with maybe a total amount for a shopping cart and with the taxes and everything added in. And it's going to be totally off. You'll have no idea what's going on. I, I, this just saved you three hours. Check somewhere that there's a parsent and there's a 0 padded uh, string somewhere uh, that's causing you drama. Let's try that again with, a, with text. Oh. <laughs> so now I got 10. Interesting. Let's see what uh, the good old Firefox will give me if I do that. And there we go. Um, you want console instead of watch? going to give you a watch so we can keep it. Let's do that here. Zero, one, zero. That gives me eight. All right, I think that's what we had in Chrome. And let's do that with string. Oh, crap. So now you've discovered that not only does Parsent hate you, but Firefox and Chrome will have different ideas of how to do Parsent. And basically, uh, this is not so much HTML5, but uh, it has to do with the newer versions of JavaScript that come out. Uh, you know, the ECMAScript uh, spec that says, in the old days, Parsent defaulted to octal whenever, I, whenever it sees a zero first. And that's kind of dumb, because we don't often do stuff in octal. So let's just make it default to uh, base 10 for the radix. And, uh, 
you, you can see now that Firefox and Chrome differ uh, because Chrome is already jumping the gun and saying, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do that. Let's, let's make life easier. And so you're going to have, if you're like me and you do your primary development in Chrome, now there's a bug in here that you didn't even see, even if you were looking for it. So just because life got better with the new version of ECMAScript, still uh, you need to keep in mind stuff like this will bite you. It's just part of the browser differences, and that one always seems to get me every couple of years. Um, I was going to show, let's see, where's my timer guy? Halfway through? Perfect. Um, let's do a couple of um, interesting things with variables. So let's say variable u. I didn't tell it anything, so it's undefined. And then let's make an in. Not name, please. Well, let's make in uh, equal to null. And then let's do a variable for z. He'll be 0. We'll make him 0. So now we have an undefined with a null. We have a z. And let's say, uh, let's just do some checks. Does u equal to false? Nope, it's undefined. Null, does that, is that equal to false? No. 0 equal to false? Yes. OK. So not u, true, not z, true, not 0, true. OK. So right away, you, you can see that we have uh, what seems like just slightly different behavior with the way we're doing some of these Boolean checks. And that is uh, JavaScript's equals equals is a, is a coercive equals. It, it means, are these things equal? and change the types if you, if you want to, and see if they're equal but not really equal. So an example, false equal to 0? Yes, it is. Uh, is false really equals? That's what I call the triple equal. Is it really equals to, to 0? No, it's not. Um, and what this uh, is leading into is something that you'll see when uh, typically in a function, like a JavaScript function, you'll see that the checking of the parameters. And what folks do now is they'll, let's say we have a parameter called uh, you know, price that's coming into a function. And it may or may not be defined. So people will say, well, var price equals price or some default value. right? And then what is price equals? Oh, it equals 3.33. So um, it's this uh, falsy and truthy uh, behavior in JavaScript that allows uh, things like this to work. So you could say um, var some like real variable is going to be equal to uh, null or undefined or my zero or um, awesome. Awesome. And let's see what that guy is. He's awesome. Because uh, null, as we saw up here, undefined, zero, those all uh, basically equal false when you check them with a not explicit triple equals. Uh, so that's just another little trick that uh, you're going to want if to, you, if you run into weirdness with functions not returning the right values or, or something like that, uh, it could be that you're dealing with something that you think is, should evaluate to false or true, and it's actually going to the other one. So uh, just think of that in the back of your brain. Maybe you'll uh, save yourself some time. And then uh, finally, you can't um, name your variables starting with numbers like that. Uh, or you get, maybe you get, it doesn't like it. Um, <laughs> unexpected token. That's illegal. <laughs> No smoking weed in the 90s. Uh, so it does now. <laughs> so uh, with my two minutes left, is that two out of 12 or two out of 10? All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, we're not going to talk about objects, uh, but what I will say is just a recommendation for you guys. When you're writing your functions, 
uh, let's see, here, no, here. You can see, uh, you know, a lot of people, we write the functions, we put a little comment on the top, say what it does, here's this function. Um, I recommend that you put the function uh, comments in JavaScript on the inside purely for this reason, and that is that we can as, at least if you're a library designer or anybody making code that someone else will use, they can just do something like this and get the comments right in the debugger. Notice that top comment doesn't show, but anything in the function body will show. So it's just uh, be nice to the rest of us. Well, give us the comments in the function, and then we don't have to go and view the source of your JavaScript somewhere. That's it. Thanks, guys. That's my dog. It's the cutest thing ever. OK, so I'm going to talk about dropping the widgets and embracing HTML5 uh, functionality. Um, so I'm going to go through a few specific use cases. And uh, he mentioned all this stuff. Uh, I'll go ahead and answer now where you can find me, uh, at ATXRyan on Twitter. And uh, I run a bunch of local meetups, so if you're local in Austin and you don't, you're not connected to the, to the web scene, definitely come and talk to me, because we have an awesome community and you should be involved. Okay, so the main crux of this talk is that we have a, uh, there are tons of widgets out there that are either jQuery UI, YUI, maybe your own custom role thing, MooTools, uh, that maybe, maybe you don't need to have a widget for anymore. You can actually embrace and use the, the native, HTML function, uh, native HTML5 functionality. And so widgets would be one of, the, one of those. So right up here, I've got uh, the jQuery UI code for a slider. Um, and it works if I, if I grab it with my mouse, right? But because it's, it's this widget, not only do I have the, the overhead of actually loading the library, parsing the DOM, and then attaching these events and doing all that stuff, but I also, I would have to do extra work to get it, work, to, get it to work with touch. So right now, it doesn't work with touch, and that sucks. Now this one is the native slider, and it does work with touch. And uh, I didn't have an example of this, but you know there are probably in code bases that you work in. There's probably uh, 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 validation code that's still left over. There's probably uh, JavaScript placeholder code that's still left over. And in, in a lot of cases, you need to evaluate whether or not you still need to be uh, working with JavaScript to make those changes that you that you had to in the past when you can rely on the actual HTML5 stuff. Uh, progress thing is another, is another place where we can replace something. Here's the jQuery UI code for the progress bar. Again, we have to actually parse the DOM to get the progress bar element and then attach the progress bar uh, widget to that element. And we have this awesome progress bar that HTML5 gives us. In fact, it even animates it for us, or at least Chrome does. Autocomplete, here's one. Um, you know, a lot of these I'm going to show, they have varying levels of browser support. We can talk about that later, about how you may want to uh, come in and either polyfill or shim, that, shim those. But if you look, this is a completely, uh, uh, I don't want to say native, but this, this solution for this autocomplete is proprietary to the way that jQuery UI is doing it. And I feel like even if you need to support browsers that don't support native autocomplete, you can do it in such a way that at a certain point in the future, you can remove that library and hopefully you're only supporting the browsers that need to. So you can see here that if I start typing Microsoft, it'll come up. But then I have here this autocomplete with the awesome data list um, element. And I, I give it an ID and I say list equals browser makers. And then I say Microsoft and it's right there. So you know, this, is, this is purely uh, just in the markup itself. I'm not having to rely on a, on a, um, on a widget to actually get this functionality. Uh, drag and drop. There we go, that should be cleared. Drag and drop is another one of those. Um, I don't have an example of the jQuery UI one, but uh, you know, we have native drag and drop now. You can, you can set a, excuse me, you can set a, uh, you can set draggable on elements. The image element is actually draggable by default, so I didn't have to set draggable equals true. I just wanted to have something up there. But then I can drag things that, you know, I set this uh, drop area as a draggable, and then I can grab text from it. If I, uh, if, I, if, I had, if I wasn't running in full screen, I could also show that I could grab things from outside of the actual browser environment, such as 
uh, you know, pretty much text string from anywhere, any, anything that can go in your uh, clipboard. Uh, we all know about audio and video API, so I just want to throw that up there, but obviously uh, you definitely want to use the native stuff wherever you can. And then content editable, this one's fun. This one's fun. Uh, so just by adding content editable to uh, any element pretty much, it allows you to edit the, the actual uh, child, um, uh, 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 the actual child notes of that, or excuse me, not child notes, but the actual text of, of that. Um, and so in a lot of ways you can use that to, uh, you know those places where you have a form but you don't really need the form, like you have a text area, you have an input just because you needed some way to capture the data, but it doesn't really fit within the flow and then you end up styling it in a weird way so that it fits, right? We don't really need that, you don't really need that input. You know when you have an input that's orphaned from an actual form? Maybe you really only needed a content, input, or a content editable to, to uh, make those changes and then parse out that, that, uh, that new uh, DOM structure. And then there's some things that, uh, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I find that I may use jQuery just because I like the selector engine. Uh, and I'm just gonna add a class or something, or I'm gonna do some, some I'm gonna get the value of, of an element, but I really I'm really using it so I don't have to do document.getElementById. So, but we have this thing called, uh, called document query selector all, or there's also query selector. And in that case, I can still do, um, ex I can still use a, a selector engine that's equivalent to, uh, or better than Sizzle, and it's native, right? And Sizzle actually will default to this for any browser that does uh, support uh, query selector all. And then if I want to still have the dollar sign syntax, I can do that, so that's not a problem at all. Uh, equally, uh -oh. equally, I know a lot of times uh, you may be using uh, cookies for kind of storage that you, that's not really uh, uh, session-based, and so you can definitely use local storage for those things instead. And then CSS, how, much, how many of y'all's uh, CSS for any sort of uh, tabular data looks like that, with, uh, that's peppered with class odd or class even and odd or stuff like that. Um, you can definitely use the nth child odd to, um, to add uh, zebra striping. And then date. So here's a jQuery UI implementation of date. I made it massive just because I could style it. There's the HTML5 impl implementation of date. So all I had to do was type equals date. Chrome is nice enough to give me a date picker. And what's, what's good about this, there's some pros and cons about this. I'm happy to discuss uh, either of them. So one of the issues with using the native controls here, we're used to, when you implement the control yourself, you get to style it however you want to, you get to brand it, you get to do all this stuff, right? In this way, it's a browser control, so literally, uh, whenever I click this, Chrome is giving me this, um, uh, this look and feel. Now the pros there that is consistent, you know, this is for the users and, and they would be, uh, if ever everyone like coalesced around one, uh, around using this, then they're expected or they would be, um, uh, it would be familiar to them, right? Or is every single selector be in different ways, some of them not being accessible, you know, uh, some of them not being bound to, uh, to keys. Some of them not clearing. There we go. Uh, another one, uh, I didn't put the jQuery UI one up here. I thought I did actually, but it's not there. Uh, but color picker. So this is a native uh, browser color picker. And so I can select that, do OK. And now the value of that input is whatever the hex code of the green that I just, uh, I just grabbed was. And I didn't have to have any you know, widget, no, no overhead for the library or anything like that. And then this one, I've got to switch browsers, but this is one of my favorite features, uh, once it's more widely adopted. So Firefox currently is the only browser that's doing this, but I love this context menu. Um, so you know whenever you go to a site and you right click, and I'm not even talking about the sites that disable right clicking because they don't want you to steal images. Those, those are silly, because I'll steal the images anyway. But, <laughs> uh, but the sites that, that they're, they're, they're not disabling the context menu, but they're taking it over for, for what's a legitimate purpose, but then they're removing the native functionality, right? It's like, well, how do I, how do, I do what I wanted to do, you know? Like, I may have a one password, uh, 
Well, if I had like plugins that also, you know, like browser plugins or OS plugins, whatever, like they take over those things. And here, Firefox gives me the functionality to uh, add commands to the context menu without overriding the, whole, the entire context menu and like preventing default behavior. And so you can see here that if I wanted to have this uh, awesome feature that, you know, you, you, anything you want to right click on, you can send it directly to me, um, then I can just implement that and, and not have to uh, overload or uh, overwrite the, the other functionality such as the bookmark, uh, inspect element, back, reload. And like I said, uh, I purposely glossed over all kinds of browser support. You know, a lot of what I showed up there works in Chrome, works in Firefox. A good bit of it works in IE10, but not all of it. Like the date picker doesn't work in IE10. Uh, a lot of this stuff is still being uh, spec'd out, but that doesn't mean you can't start to use it and start to think about replacing those, uh, those widgets and those libraries that you kind of like just you know, put in there with native functionality. That's it. Can you hear me? All right. So like you said, my name is Austin Halleck. I'm a student at UT. Uh, more importantly, co-founder of Clay.io. So like you said, platform for HTML5 games. We do two things. It's, one is a marketplace. Uh, two, it's an API for high-level features like user accounts, leaderboards, payment processing, uh, all that good stuff. So this talk is a little bit about jumping into HTML5 games. It's a very quick overview uh, of how to develop an HTML5 game. But I really think that the best way to, to learn how to develop something is to actually dig into the code. So as you can see, this presentation itself is an HTML5 game, and the code for that is up on GitHub. So I would suggest, if you're interested, just to, to dig through that code, play around, tweak some things, and, and hopefully learn more from that. So first up, why HTML5? Uh, the big reason is, it, is because it's cross-platform. So you develop it once, and it'll work on desktops, mobile devices, tablets, uh, and eventually even uh, smart TVs and consoles. Uh, another big reason is the very quick development process. So you don't have to wait for compilation. Uh, and you can tweak things on the fly. So uh, like uh, Aaron was showing, uh, you can tweak things in the console so you can change the speed of the game and get it to feel just right. Uh, and finally, the games are very easily accessible. So you can play them from a browser. You don't need to actually download the game to play them. So just a, a basic overview of the concept, you're using the canvas element. So that's the only HTML that you're actually using is just creating a canvas element. Uh, and then you're manipulating that canvas element with a whole bunch of JavaScript. So you're, you're basically clearing the entire canvas and redrawing it 60 times a second. So you have 16 milliseconds uh, to do all of your game logic if you want to run uh, at 60 frames a second. 30 frames a second is still pretty good, so you have uh, 32 milliseconds to do everything. So again, the only HTML that you're actually using is the canvas element. Uh, and then you get a reference to that element uh, just with a little bit of JavaScript. Then ideally you want to scale it to the entire width of the browser. Uh, that way it'll play well on phones too. Uh, and then you get the, the context of that canvas, which is uh, what you'll be using to, to draw certain things to it. So like I mentioned, you're, you're redrawing the, the entire canvas. Uh, unless you're trying to make it a little bit more efficient, then you can just redraw certain aspects of the canvas. Uh, but you have a game loop that runs ideally 60 times a second. So you might think that you would use set timeout or set interval to, to run that game loop. But ideally, you want to use window.requestAnimationFrame. Uh, and the real reason you want to do that is uh, it, it takes into account the CPU load. And, and on slower devices like phones, it'll, it'll drop down the, the frame rate so that you're not uh, piling up all these game loops that have to run. And then also, if you, if you are using requestAnimationFrame and you change the browser tab, uh, it'll actually pause the game so you're not using a bunch of CPU resources and battery. So just a basic example of, of drawing to the canvas. Uh, just a, a basic box. So again, we're using that context that we, that we grabbed earlier. Uh, we're setting the fill style to a certain color, so you can use a, a hex value, an RGB value, or even gradients. Uh, and then we're using the fill rect method uh, with parameters x, y, width, and height to draw the actual rectangle. And before we do that, we pause the game loop, because if we're drawing it, and then the game loop continually uh, clears the canvas uh, every 16 milliseconds, you would only see the box for 16 milliseconds. So this does all three of those, and as you can see, it draws a, a white box at the top right. Then we'll resume the game loop, and we'll move on to drawing images to the canvas. So it, it, it's fairly similar. For this, you have to create the, the image object. So we're going to create the image object, uh, set the source to uh, an SVG image, which I would highly suggest that you use. That way, it'll scale well to all these different resolutions you want your game to run on. Uh, and then we have to wait for the, the image to actually load before we uh, use the draw image method. If you do it before the image is loaded, then you'll get a DOM error, which is really bad. So 
Let's try that out, and you can see it's drawing the entire sprite sheet. So later we'll talk a little bit more about how to draw just specific aspects of that sprite sheet. So here we have the player object. So we have just a JavaScript object that has all the properties and methods for the, for the player itself. Uh, some of the properties that you really care about are the position, velocity, and acceleration for movement. Uh, and then we also have a draw method uh, for drawing the, the image of, of the character on the screen. So if we want to change how fast the character moves, uh, I have this walk velocity uh, parameter or property. So he moves five times as fast now. We'll drop it back down to 20 for the rest of this. Oops. So behind the scenes of how the, the player is actually moving, really all you care about is the player's position on the screen, the, the sprite's position on the screen. So we just use some really, really basic physics for that. So velocity is acceleration times time, and then the position is the velocity times the time. And what we're using for that time is, is a variable that I set, dt, which is the, the amount of time that's passed since the last time the game loop ran. So ideally that's gonna be 16 milliseconds, but it can, be, it can vary from that. And then player states. So as you can see, as the player is moving around, he has one he's walking to the right, just standing, jumping, uh, all these different sprites. So for that, we just detect what state he is uh, based on the velocity. So if the, the x velocity is greater than zero, then he's obviously walking to the right. And then we use draw image with four more parameters that, that are just for uh, offset and then the, the clip height and width for the, for the character. So that way we only have to load in the sprite sheet uh, and not each individual sprite. So collision detection is important. Uh, you'll probably have it in your game if it's a platformer game, just because you don't want the player to fall through the screen, uh, and you, don't want him, you want him to be able to land on these boxes and run into them if he's running left or right. Uh, so basic collision detection is just checking all the corners of the player and see if it's uh, within the same area that the box is actually in. Uh, but more importantly, you kinda wanna know uh, which side the player is hitting. So this is a whole bunch of code, but it's actually fairly basic. You're just checking all the specific corners uh, to see which side he's, he's on, and then you can stop his velocity in that position and move him up a little bit more. Uh, and then just wanted to touch on some advanced concepts really quick. So garbage collection, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's what the browsers do to, to prevent a whole, whole bunch of memory adding up for the browser. So if you're adding a bunch of objects and then you're no longer using them, the browser will go through and clear those out. So with games, that's kind of a big deal because again, you're running at 60 times a second, you're running it so many times that if you have a lot of unused memory, uh, it'll, take the, it'll take a while for the garbage collector to actually clear that out. So you wanna make sure that you're not making uh, a bunch of objects that aren't being used later on. Uh, if you are, you'll get a two or, two or 300 millisecond pause, which is definitely noticeable in a game, and that'll happen every couple seconds. So that's something you definitely don't wanna run into. Uh, another thing is with Retina. So you wanna have your game look really crisp on iPhones and, and iPads. Uh, and to do that, it, it's basically just setting the, the CSS to the width of the device. Uh, so you set the, the canvas's CSS width to a certain value, and the width and height attributes of the, the canvas you set to the, the width times the device pixel ratio. So if you're on an iPhone, that width uh, and height attribute of the actual canvas element will be twice as large as the CSS width and height. Um, and then another concept I wanted to touch on is being able to scale uh, the, the, the size of the game for each resolution, you definitely wanna keep that into account so you don't wanna uh, use exact fixed widths. So just like you're, if you're doing web design, you wanna have uh, fluidity, you wanna make sure that you have that in your game as well so that you can really take advantage of the technology and be on every single device. device. Um, so just a summary, HTML5 games are great. I really suggest that you just check them out, see if you're interested in making them. Uh, I think they're where web games are, are, are definitely headed. Uh, and even with things like WebGL, you could potentially see console quality games from a browser. Uh, probably still a few years down the line, but uh, hopefully sooner than later. And again, I think really looking at the source code is where you're gonna uh, find out how to develop games and really uh, learn from that. So the source code is up on GitHub. Uh, it's pretty well commented, so just take a look at that. Uh, it's part of the whole hacky, hacky hour thing tonight. The challenge is just to go into the code, see if you can tweak it, make the character run faster, see if you can add projectiles or enemies, uh, whatever you want. Uh, and then one final bit on clay.io. We are looking for a CTO, so if anyone uh, thinks they're qualified, just come chat with me. Uh, and then here is my contact email, or contact info. So just austin at clay.io and uh, at austin Halleck on Twitter. So thank you.